All right. So we were on the slide and uh, as uh, the last session discussion indicates that it was insufficient. So one of the questions was, uh, what was exactly the pretext task for image to PPG project? So basically just to uh, remind everyone. So this is the project we are talking about uh, right here. So basically what they did was uh, they did an unsupervised learning method. And what are they predicting? They are given a video of a person. Uh, can we predict the heart rate uh, based on the small variations you, skin, uh, you see on the skin of the person in the video? And they, the data set was labeled. Uh, so basically you had heart rate in form of PPG signals as labels and uh, videos of the people uh, as your input. So, so what they did was, and I'm gonna not go into each box's extreme detail, but uh, briefly, the idea was this. Um, so XA in this figure is this uh, their video frames. Um, S is a some sort of a enhancement sampler, say or saliency sampler, which they take from another project. And the idea of using S is to emphasize um, or warp the image to XSA. And this XSA is a form of XA, which is warped, that, which really amplifies the feature relevant to the task of uh, heart rate prediction. Now, <clears throat> this step is a little controversial for me uh, because to do this, to just get this sam uh, saliency sampler S, we, you will, my guess is you will need to use labels of PPG. But either way, I don't think it's necessary, uh, but it must have improved performance. That's why uh, they showed it. So just assuming that, you know, you may or may not use this saliency subsampler. Uh, by the way, the result, uh, so given XA looks like this video, uh, by the way, everybody can see my mouse pointer, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so given this video as XA, this is how XSA looks like. Uh, so it emphasizes the forehead where, uh, you know, most of the heart rate uh, variations are, uh, the skin variations, skin color variations are coming from. Um, so S may or may not be used. Um, now, what, what they do is given this uh, saliency warped, uh, video, uh, they use, they, they're trying to estimate this function G theta that gives you the Y A, which is the heart rate in form of PPG uh, signal. Uh, so a supervised way to do it is just simply this, use all the Y A labels, and they use this to just compare with how it will compare with supervised losses and uh, to, yeah, basically for evaluation. So they trained it on supervised labels but their actual self-supervised, which does not use via labels is this, this, this way. So, so the idea is to artificially change the expected heart rate frequency in the, in the video. And they use, so they uh, randomly sample um, amplifying factor RF from a distribution and they increase the uh, sampling rate of the video such that, I mean, it's, it's straightforward. If you increase the, uh, if you resample the video in a such a fashion that frames are occurring uh, faster than usual, you will see the heart rate go up because the variations are faster. So they artificially amplify the heart rate, whatever the video variations are uh, using this uh, sampler. And this will, uh, so this will be the higher heart rate than normal. Uh, that 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 was in original XA, and that that forms your negative sample in this case. So XSN is your negative sample, which is not the heart rate as XA, and this pass through G theta should give you the negative uh, embedding Y, uh, negative uh, sorry heart rate Y N, which is not true. So say the original heart rate was sixty BPM, and you magnified by one point five a factor of 1.5 using the sampler randomly. And this will be um, then uh, uh, 75. Um, did I say it right? 60. No, 90, this will be 90 BPM. Um, so, so once- Was it 
So they sample the video frames, right? And then right. that would make the heart rate goes down or whatever, right? Because you're adding more frames. Correct. Correct. Yes. Or uh, or is it like uh, I don't know? Maybe I'm getting it wrong. So do they add more video frames and then uh, assume that the timing was like uh, instead of sixty frames per second, you still I mean uh, you sample at seventy. Frames per second, and then do they add? And do they still assume it as sixty frames per second to get other so heart rates? So the exact I don't understand. Sorry. Yeah. So exact details of the method, I would really go, uh, you know, go into the paper then. Um, uh, so I just wanted to keep on high level just the relevant part of self-supervised here, but it can be done if you um, if you go through the paper, it can be done. So you are artificially, you know, making frames closer to each other. Basically, um, so the variation that was supposed to happen in say once point uh, one seconds is happening in point five seconds. So that can be done um, if that makes sense. But exact details of their implementation, you can you should look at the paper. Uh, I'm gonna continue uh, from here on and come back to this if the time permits. Um, uh, so so the basically when you get this negative heart rate, which is not actually the true representation, you can use it to invert the 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 effector you used to, to amplify so you do you know the rf randomly so you invert it and you get the positive sample back uh which was the actual heart 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 rate uh, um shown in the on those video frames so now you have the negative and the positive sample and you have the anchor embedding ya which was the actual xa's embedding so using all these three, you can use the triplet loss as we discussed in the last, and you know push FP and FA close to each other, and push apart FN and FA close to each, uh, apart from each other. There are a lot of details to this, of course, as Nitin asked uh, rightfully, and uh, but I just wanted to touch on the brief idea and discuss a lot of other stuff related to contrastive learning. Um, Okay, uh, other thing was uh, what, what is the word, the motivation of using triplet loss in that form? Uh, it is the same as we kind of guessed, discussed in the session one, that is to keep a certain margin. We introduce that alpha and we want to ignore the loss. So there should be no contribution from the loss function beyond that margin. That's why it's implemented in that max zero comma uh, lo um, loss way. Um, so that beyond, if once we go beyond that margin, there is no, it's zero. So there's no contribution. Um, another question was, what is the equa exact equation of the structured loss? So let me just remind everyone where is the structured loss in the original presentation? So it was right here. Uh, so I introduced the contrastive loss and the triplet loss. Uh, the structured loss, I just hand waved basically saying uh, that, you know, for more efficient batch implementation, you can calculate triplet loss in a batch of data, like all the permutations uh, can be calculated. The basic idea is say you sample a batch X1 to X6, and you want to form all the positive and negative uh, permutations per pairs, uh, oh, sorry, permutation triplets. Uh, so assuming dij here means a difference you know the the euclidean distance between fxi and fxj uh this is your triplet loss let me decompose it um so the l struct max zero comma l struct part is same as triplet loss uh now l struct is slightly different than the triplet loss so dij is the is from the same triplet loss that this is the distance between the um positive pairs but for the distance between the negative pairs there is a new term uh what this term says is hey just use because there are so many negative pairs just use the negative pair closest to either of the positive samples so the positive pair are the two positive samples the anchor and the positive sample and these this term says uh, you know whatever is closer to the um the anchor, whatever this term says, whatever is the closest to the uh, the positive sample, and find the closest to both of them, basically. 
so and try to push that guy apart uh, now uh, to for implementing this is very hard to implement um, so they, they replace max functions with uh, smooth approximation to the max function which is log some exponential and that's what the final loss function is about <clears throat> now the final question in the last one where we ended the discussion and then the session was how does this um, influence your loss even calculate the um, uh, the density ratio so let me just try to go over it um, um, so so the so if you think about a multi class classifier uh, a neural network classifier usually the way it works is you give an input and you try to tell between n classes uh, and so the way you do it is we assign a, a, a score using the network or the log it as it's called and then do softmax activation so to so that they are realistic probability values norm basically softmax just normalizes these values and then you do your multi-class log it function now the same can be thought of in this case, but the, the form of the logit function is different. Uh, so it requires both X and Y. So, uh, and the Y could be Y plus or a negative X is suppose your anchor here. And you get an embedding ZX and getting a, get an, another embedding ZY. And you calculate a similarity score, uh, like a cosine similarity most commonly used. And this is finally your log it value. So normally log it value depends on one input that is your, you know, whatever you're trying to cl classify, say an image of a dog or cat. So that's just H of A. But in this case, the log, log it value really depends on two inputs, the anchor and the positive or the negative pair. So you, you get this H of XI, YI. And continuing from the last session's discussion, we have this, uh, batch sampled where x is the anchor and y plus is the positive and y n minus one negative y minuses you decompose this into a data set x i y i one or zero label uh to to make it you know equivalent to uh the classification problem uh and uh the one is only assigned to the node where uh it is the positive pair and all the negative pairs are assigned zero level so finally uh what this all stuff represents represents is uh the prob you know the the probability of y i being equal to one is your final uh influence e loss function um which corresponds directly to a multi-class uh uh classifications act final output value and we are trying to maximize this um so that was where we ended things last time um now let me just proceed so uh, today's outline was mostly about discussing the unanswered questions from last time you can refer to one note uh, notebook um and we have done that already now i'm gonna go into um predictive versus contrastive learning i'm gonna tell what what what, what i've what I think it is, what, what are the differences, major differences. And then I want to talk about uh, improvements that are, are you know, suggested in the literature to really make contrastive work, contrastive learning work. Uh, some of them are applicable in some cases and others are in other cases. I have skipped this section of analyzing MI estimator perspective because I don't think time will permit that. So we're not going to discuss that anymore. Uh, that would leave some time for uh, more discussion and maybe coming back to the unanswered questions of this session. <clears throat> so this figure is something that I, you know, kind of like. Um, this is from a paper uh, sourced here, uh, but the it shows, you know, how we think about uh, predictive features that are predictive features are, by the way, given uh, input, you're trying to predict an output. And this is basically or most of the supervised deep learning so whatever these latent values you learn is your z here uh, and the contrastive features is what we have been discussing so given both the modalities um whatever you i mean you found trying to form the z 
you can see how they are you know the the, the latent z that is formed is in a very different fashion uh, now this paper actually showed that contrastive features are superior in a couple of downstream tasks which this was not trained for so obviously predictive learning would perform better on the same task that is to predict v2 but on all the other tasks it was the z was not as transferable as the contrastive was and uh, the authors uh, attribute they conjecture a couple of uh, hypotheses um they don't really verify it but they propose that these are these are the possibilities so one of them i'm listing here other one did not make sense to me uh, I, I mean I, I did not think that was the reason but uh, that's why I'm skipping it, but you can refer to the paper. So one of the one of the things that they mentioned was whenever we're doing predicting predictive learning in deep learning, uh, we are making this assumption that at the output node, all the you know samples of V2J say in the pixels of this in this case the image pixels uh, of V2 are totally independent given the complete image V1. Uh, and this independence assumption is not there while forming the latent Z of contrastive. Uh, there is another reason I think why contrastive has uh, advantage over predictive, predictively learned feature. And I'm going to discuss that in the next slide. Um, so how can we see that that you know that that assumption? I mean, I I don't really get what this how, is yes, that's correct. Basically. Okay, okay, so the, how can we see that? All right, so thinking about something very simple, uh, if I were to, so these are the colored channels, uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the colored channels of this image, and this is a monochrome image, and you're trying to predict colors, basically. Mm -hmm. um, now, if j the most naive way I will train this such a predictive model is uh, mean squared error. Now, okay. when I do mean squared error, uh estimation in probabilistic terms that is uh max a maximum likelihood estimation on the output node uh with the assumption that the output node is gaussian with the mean given by the network values and that gaussian assumption inherently implies it's an in, in, they, they assume the form is an independent gaussian uh, so when so so for the basically long story short to, for the mean squared error to make probabilistic sense there is a uh, that independence assumption in the values of the output each node each activation value i mean it is possible that the g trained might i mean the g's final output is as big as the image space of v2 right um, the number of pixels so you know like the say the top part of those pixels are can be using a different part of z which means they are not you know just the same model i mean i i have a hard time understanding like this p the 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 product the product suggests that you know, each pixel is, you know, essentially have the same probability distribution given the V1, which is obviously not true, you know, in the sense that otherwise I would get something like a noise figure out of this if, you know, if each pixel were yes. determined by the same ah. exact um, posterior, you know, conditional density. Right, I, I see your point. So uh, what you're saying is the dependencies are in the you know penultimate layers uh, between V two Js. So even you know independence is not really true anyways uh, because you know V two J can be coming from the same node V two one or V two two B can be affected from the same node and then the, that's the dependency. Um, I, I understand your point, uh, and uh, I agree with it. So I don't, I, I, yeah. So there, that's why there's, it was a very hand wavy conjecture in their paper as well, with no proofs. Uh, but they were trying to propose something why contrastive features were better. Um, now the 
what I think about it is this and why they might be better. So these are, I mean, I've tried to form an information diagrams based on, you know, uh, um, like similar idea to, you know, mutual information uh, diagrams that we study in information theory, but hopefully they would make sense uh, to even people who are not familiar with it. Um, so the idea is this, when suppose we are doing predictive learning and here uh, so assume that we are given input X and we are trying to predict Y plus the positive example. Um, this is based on the same figure as previous, just the V1 and V2 terminology is X and Y, X comma Y plus. So the predictive features, what they want to really, what, what they want to keep is whatever is common between X and Y plus. So from X, they can at best extract the common information about Y plus. So they definitely want this information in Z. And whatever is not common, so all this sh shaded part of the left side of X, it does not matter. It can be in Z and it cannot be in Z. So this is typically referred as nuisance. Uh, and this, this can really you know, confuse the network and reduce its generalizability, the more the nuisance captured in the latent. Um, now, the predictive learning does not really care about how much nuisance is included in Z, uh, as long as the mutual information or the common part is included. So moving on to contrastive, thinking about you know, this little diagram here that Zx and Zy plus should be close, that is very similar to predictive learning. So they really want to capture the common part, yes. But at the same time, if the X's nuisance is captured, like the predictive learning, uh, ZX and ZY plus would start pulling apart because Y plus does not really have that information, that nuisance information from X. So ZX and ZY plus won't be that close. Uh, oh, they will be only nicely close for all the samples if the mutual information is captured by Z, uh, the common part only. Uh, so it's important that to learn to find this Z, it throws out these new nu these nuisances, uh, which is the non-common part. And in general, I think all parts of this uh, there is no shaded region that does not matter. To bring these two close and to push negative y minus apart, there is no part of this circle, uh, this information diagram that is not important, and they just try to find a perfect compromise because there are certain parts like overlap between y minus x and y plus that can so one of the to to push these together it has to be thrown away but to push these far apart it has to be kept so there is conflict going on and network just converges to something but but all the parts are really important it's like you you have to care about every uh, part of this information diagram uh, unlike predictive learning where you can add nuisance without a reason. I I don't know if that made sense, but um, that's how I look at it. Why contrastive might be giving good, better results for tra while, while transferring features, see. <clears throat> now, if those information diagram made any sense, I'm gonna quickly talk about improvements uh, uh, proposed in the literature, just four main improvements that people propose. It's number one is data augmentation. And it's based on the idea, you know, uh, they want to expand the nuisance area of the uh, information. So they try to keep the common sem semantics intact uh, and add nuisance to both X and Y plus uh, to, to really make the networks focus on the mutual information and stop caring about the everything that is not contained in mutual information. So this, th these are some of the common uh, data augmentations done for, um, uh, uh, you know, instance discrimination using images. So basically, irrespective of any of these transformations, it still remains remains the same image of the same dog, and they should be closed in the embedding space. It should not get altered uh, by uh, all these uh, transformations. 
The other improvement, and this one really affects performance significantly and is pre proposed for all sorts of contrastive learning is hard negative sampling. Um, so hard negative sampling is basically this, and you saw this idea in when we discussed the structured laws just now. So say A is this anchor point, uh, the anchor sample, and P is your positive sample. And uh, there is a negative sample that is very close to either of them. So it could be N1 or N2 in this picture. And it's we don't care about N3 because it's margin apart or alpha apart from A and P both, but we might care about N1 and N2 much more. So it's really about during training, you try to find the negative samples that are close to the anchor and positive and try to push them apart, uh, push them further from those. So this requires an extra step to you know, sort all the negative samples and select the one uh, that is. There are several algorithms uh, uh, proposed for hard negative mining. Um, uh, and you know, uh, it, it's, it's still an open problem how to do it more efficiently. Um, another thing that people have noticed, and I think this is mostly applicable to, you know, tasks that are like instance discrimination where you don't have multiple modalities. So what people notice is this, um, they said that, you know, after doing all this contrastive loss, uh, I see that, you know, if we z use Z to transfer as the transfer features versus I use H, H is basically um, features in some penultimate layers, layers before Z. They said that H were much more transferable, much more generic uh, for multiple downstream tasks compared to Z. And that made sense because Z are more conditioned towards this, this pretext task, or in this case, contrastive task, uh, but H can be more generic. Um, so I thought this was pretty, you know, ob kind of obvious thing that this is gonna happen. Um, but so people propose that, okay, so think about this entire problem as having a projection head after these features that we really want, which is H and, um, and calculate contrastive laws on Z. So now Z can be specific to that contrastive task, but H will, sorry, and H will remain more generic for transfer learning to a lot of downstream tasks. So this is really about, you know, having more general H that can perform well on multiple downstream tasks. By the way, I don't think this will work well if we, the objective is to capture, you know, mutual information uh, between the variables because Z is really much brings much brings the both uh, modalities in multimodal cases much closer than H. So if we, the objective there is to, you know, really find the commonality between the two modalities, X and Y, um, Z would be a better candidate. If the objective is generic transfer learning, H would be a better candidate. Um, the other part of the proposed improvement is just get my, more negative samples. And we have discussed in the session one that there is an information theoretic view of increasing and having more n samples and they have empirically shown too that adding more negative samples in that loss term does give improvements in a, a final uh, downstream accuracies uh, of a classification task this is all in, in mostly image net experiments um so end to end there here refers to you know doing what we discussed and memory bank and moco are the techniques uh, i will show in the next slide um so and the one and one of the ideas is you know the straightforward idea is to just use larger batch size which would increase your negative samples n um but it's it could be it starts getting unfeasible very soon if you see the k here is the same as n by the way uh, this figure is just a different paper with different notation k and n are the same thing um so k log scale is you know they they're trying very large uh, batch sizes and it really becomes unfeasible, especially for larger modalities like videos uh, to have such large batch sizes if you don't have thousands of GPUs. <clears throat> so a couple of things that people have proposed um, is to you, so keep a memory bank. So the main idea, first idea was to keep a memory bank of 
these features themselves. So, um, so why? So they have kept the embeddings of uh, all the past samples in in a memory bank. Uh, so embeddings are easier to store than the actual images or the modalities themselves. Um, so they store them embeddings and they try to use them for uh, loss calculations. Now embeddings will go stale because encoder here is that same encoder we have been talking about that that is learned. So encodings of the negative sample will start going stale. So they are updated at every iteration, uh, whichever, uh, but through a momentum term. So basically keep the new embedding, uh, uh, keep, take the old embedding, uh, and add, you know, the new X size alpha time. So basically a momentum based update to keep the memory bank features updated. Uh, this has a big problem, of course, that you have to store the entire data sets embedding in your memory, which can also be limiting, uh, uh, depending upon your compute resources. Uh, another problem with this is the features can really go stale because it's just updating that one or that few negative sample or oh, sorry positive that only one positive sample that was taken during a batch and all the remaining samples are still stale which means they are from the previous the features from the previous epochs um so uh, there was a new proposal uh where they basically say okay we're not going to keep you know updating features one by one because that's unfeasible uh, that's that makes the entire set day very stale they're going to keep a copy of that encoder itself but that will be slowly updated compared to the original encoder that you are training so from from this momentum encoder is basically version of this encoder that is updated slower than this encoder and uh, you to basically update the parameters of the momentum encoder theta 2 here uh, which is you know old theta two uh, with uh, some one minus alpha times the new theta one. Uh, so this encoder is how you um, uh, calculate your uh, your your new features um, to to for for the um, uh, uh, contrast and negative features. And the second contribution was hey don't keep the entire data set keep a fixed batch of old features very large but keep them in memory um uh, and you know whichever you so it that q size is fixed say um 4000 or something uh, re relatively large and you dq the the oldest one and put in the latest one after the last update so they maintain a finite q of old negative features um in where in memory as in memory bank idea you have to keep the entire data set features and instead of updating the you know the features one by one they update update the entire encoder uh on a momentum based uh update so that's all i wanted to cover so yeah maybe we can since we have a little bit time we can also discuss that third point that you try to clarify uh, I didn't want to break the rhythm, so I didn't ask many questions. You know, like the point where. We... Let, let me share. You know. So, uh, you want me to just repeat this discussion? Yeah, just repeat, and you know, basically, let me tell you what my um, uh, my difficulty is understanding this multi-class login you have like a lot of classes there. I don't know what are those classes and how do they relate? I, I would have thought it would be either positive or negative. You know, why are there additional classes? And what do they represent? Okay. Let me... But you can start from beginning then, you know. Go no, 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 no. I, I understand the question. So, <clears throat> so what do the classes represent here? Is this? Um, let me. Right. So, uh, just I'm I'm not gonna copy this entire thing. I'm just gonna make a little mm -hmm. box. Uh, but basic idea is that you know you have two inputs to calculate this uh, lo logic um, uh, x and a y. 
and you get a log it score at x y right and uh, your question is uh, what does that multi class cl represent in contrast learning case um, so in in normal um, multi class classification um, you have the say that you have n classes and you have p1 to pn hat so you have estimates <clears throat> of probability of which class your input a belongs to and so so this is p1 so the first term is basically probability of uh, this guy being, you know, belonging from the first class. So, uh, yeah, I don't need to write that. It's obvious. In 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 this case, what this represents is so you you will have x one y one x two y two, and you will get h one h two x y till x and y n and what this represents is depending upon in the space say this is your anchor x which is basically all x i's x i for all i and this is your y one point And uh, you have y2, the negative guy somewhere here, and y3 somewhere here, and so on. So what this represents is thinking about classes. So um, these two be must belong to the same class. And in a meaningful space, they will be closely clustered together. And- okay, First of all, when you say these two, which Again, is, positive is that one x or multiple x's so there is only one x and that's okay. repeated n times okay okay so there is just one anchor that is so that's an x okay. i for all i there's only one x and okay. uh, and uh you you have this oh well the positive guy should be close to it so it belongs to the same class in that sense and all the other guys should not belong to that class so um so so the basically that n in this case really corresponds to um maximizing the probability of these guys being close the probability score of these guys being close that's it that's what it belongs okay, so but then there is only two scores right two scores that add up to one. I mean, the probability that it's being close or one minus probability of being close, probability of being far. There's only two classes. Exactly. There's not n classes. There's exactly. n answers. Right. But, but they are coming just, from one. Right. So you just maximize that one, as you said, the probability of them being close. That's the only value you maximize. This, these just values, these shows up in the denominator because you want okay, to first of all i don't see when you say this we okay. don't have what idea what you're uh, saying uh, okay so i'm saying all the negative ones just show up in the denominator when you normalize to get that pi you you are correct that the only probability that we maximize is these guys being close but to make it a normalized value uh, uh, the score is normalized saying e to the power h1 xy mm -hmm. upon e to the power h i xy for all i 1 2 n. so that's where the other values show up but you are correct that we are just we just care about them being close and others being far okay um okay They basically gave an interpretation of the log it in this case. 
Okay, yeah, so I, I you know, I, this I get, but, you know, the fact that trying to write it as a softmax of something where that network doesn't even exist, right? I mean, okay. this is the close function. I take it and I accept it. It's okay. reasonable, but no need to, you know, in okay. my opinion, to, yeah, yeah. to try to write it as a softmax and create this network, which is right. not that real. Okay, well, I, I get it now. Um, Maybe your question last time was really, what is the structure of this approximator? Uh, you wanted to know, I, I think your answer was just the first image that I drew. Yes, just that little thing where you have, though, I mean, now, <laughs> now that I see it, is G1, G2 the same thing or different? They can be same, they can be different. It does not matter to the structure. The structure of H can be anything. Uh, it's at the end of the day, you just need a scoring score. So G1 and G2 can be same, can be different. It does not change your, um, depending upon your problem, you can have them same or different. Why would it be different? I mean, is it different in, in practice or is it same? Yes, for multimodal problems, it is different. For same problems, it is not. And why, I mean, so what are we doing with this scoring function? We're trying to find a, uh, that density ratio, approximate that density ratio that takes in two inputs. Now, this is based on this cosine similarity in an embedding yes. space, which should make same sense and stuff. So at the end of the day, what you want is, hey, how likely it is that X and Y came from the same, dis the, the joint distribution instead of the marginal. Yeah, f y x is that precisely that expression the the cosine of the angle between z uh, yes. dx and z y yes. plus yes okay. yes yes all right okay I don't have any questions on that one now we can I guess go back to somewhat harder to figure out when it's a time signal so i think it's good to discuss this a little further um first of all that when you go back to that diagram yeah right there so is x a uh one image or a window with images Yeah, so all these, I mean, usually uh, you're correct. So in this case, it, cases, the, it's, it's, a, it's a window base. So it has to be a sequence of, so if you see, uh, it has to be a window, the same time window in the PPG signal and same time window in the frames. Even in PCAVS, it, it has to be the same time window of the um, audio signal and same time window of the video signal. So there's the same idea. Say so you take, one second of PPG, so you take one second of the video frames. Okay, so in here, as I understand, I'm inserting frames, I'm creating a, a video of a hard, faster heart rate. Yes. Right? And I'm trying to train the G. Yes. Um, so this is the part which is, you know, basically that um, S doesn't matter, right? S is just like some trick to trick. make the forehead bigger. Yes. Okay, S doesn't matter. So XAS is still a group of frames. Correct. It maps to G theta, G theta X on it and yes. creates one vector, not necessarily have a frame structure. Right, I mean, it just takes the frames, yes. K frames, and produces one vector, like your Z before, which is uh -huh. an embedding of that frame. So my question is basically, you know, how can I, since Y doesn't have a frame structure itself, how can I take out, how can I apply our inverse to yes. it? Yes, right. So there, there, there is a frame structure to their loss function. So like. The, uh, this is a very simplified representation. 
but it will have that, as you say, the temporal correspondence should be there. Uh, so there will be, so like frame one or some, you know, some time step. Uh, so Y A would be like, Y A at time zero, Y A at time one, and Y A at time two, and so okay, on. Okay, then X A is not a collection of frames. X A is a single frame. Then. You see, if a, X A is a collection of frames, I can insert stuff in it. Fine, I, that's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Let me but, just, uh, let, let me let me let me just say this again. Um, uh, you know, maybe so. Assume G theta is an R N N. And okay. you have these collections of frames, as so you have say six frames. You yes. put them into this RNN and you take the final embedding. So you are you so it can be just one vector of maybe that memory of that RNN at final final state. Just like okay. you know, people embed those natural language sentences for translation taking an English sentence, put it in one embedding, and then using that embedding to have the entire French sentence come out. Okay, but you know, again, the YA yes. is some summary information of the previous okay. six frames. Yes, yes. So similarly, YN2. Yes. How can I insert and subtract stuff from YN? YN is just one, one answer. A summary of six. I mean, it's easy to to make a XAS because it consists of six frame. YN has only one one number in it, summarizing that XA. Right, but so say your Y. Just imagine it being actual mm -hmm. heart rate or in the frequency domain, right? Mm -hmm. So what YA will represent is given all these frames. What frequency does you do you say it's the FFT? Okay. Right. And same for Y N. Right. So it will have diff, you know, different frequencies. So in an ideal case per se, there will be like FFTs, these Y A, Y N, and Y P. Um, and this introduction will actually introduce this extra frequency in oh sorry, it will shift the um the frequency. Perfect example. Perfect example. Yes, Y A is one FFT, Y N is another FFT with a peak somewhere else. Right. It's correct. Absolutely. Yes. And now, how am I? And it's one FFT. I cannot D. I cannot D. You know, D D D frame it, basically. What's the? You know, how do I apply R to the FFT? It's easy to apply R to number of frames. You just insert stuff in it. How? You know, how do you get? How do you play around with an FFT? Because you knew how much you say, so you know the frequency right here. So yes. once you do that in say image domain, right? You know how much YN will shift by compared to YA. But you know, this was just pure discussion, right? So since I, I'm, I, I don't even know, maybe it is FFT, you know, rotated in some coordinate system. I have no idea where and when I look into why, it's not going to look like FFT. You know, it was a discussion for our discussion. It's it it embeds the information of the FFT, but I mean, since G is arbitrary, it could be any rotation of FFT. So I, I think, wouldn't know what to do to it. So I think what your question is: How do they put in RF inverse on Y N? Yes, exactly. That's my question. Without knowing what YN represents, really, I mean, they know that in that Y there is some information about heart rate. How can they take it out? You know, how can they, like you say, shift the peak back? Because mm -hmm. Y could be FFT multiplied with some I rotation. Agree. I agree. I need to read the paper in the length. It sounds like this might have a time structure then to be able to do that, as as you were pointing out. Um, so I have I'll have to read in more, read it in more detail, uh, and I will I can get back about that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I forgot what Nitin was asking, but yeah. Nitin, Nitin you want to ask it again? How do they do this? Huh. How they can okay. do this? I think RF. This re sampling of changing the frequency uh, of the heart rate. 
uh, my my question was not very relevant i was i was trying to understand how they were i guess uh, forming the pretext task um, but i didn't yeah but the inverse task i don't understand as well so inversion so what is the inverse thing uh, it takes from so you said that the, they inverted back right or yeah was... so so i don't know if this came with a supplementary but uh, this is the entire discussion about the that resampling factor rf this this is it this is all it is um there might be a supplementary to it i'll need to look into it that exactly how they improve I mean, it is somewhat you know important for us right so our ideas in was you know more naive in the sense that we were saying we were going to look at other ppgs at other times with the assumption that their heart rates won't be the same and you know essentially thinking negative samples are going to come from future but we are not guaranteed of course you know the guys heart rate might be coming back to that no, same region we did not assume that their heart rates cannot be same we assumed that their um, motion artifact cannot be same that's why i when you proposed that we should make an yeah. embedded space of ecg and bpg i was against it because mm -hmm. the heart rates can be same but mm -hmm. motion artifact is very unlikely to be exactly same perhaps i don't know i mean it depends on like for example yeah, if motion artifact walking yeah. you might be walking again so yeah. they are artificially creating yeah negative samples by focusing okay yeah i mean I, we can think of what is analogous in our case what how what, do you create what what is how do you create negative samples artificially is that the question for us yeah. for us yes yes yeah i was i had pulled up a couple of papers who try to okay. create artificial samples on ecg so i was trying to think about it but uh i haven't okay. really have a but, yeah this was very helpful yeah i think it's yeah it helps us to think more abstractly about this rather than focusing on one paper and trying to see how ours work okay okay good uh, good job i will thank you